come Holy Spirit, fill Andy, uh, give him the word to speak to us today, to draw us nearer to you, and fill our hearts, Lord, open our hearts to receive that word, and may everything be to your glory, Jesus. Amen. 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 I thought it was just Christmas time. It might be a good, good time to get a family photo. Would that be all right? I normally get all the backs of your heads. So we're going to have a practice one. I'm going to do one of these pano ones. And the practice one... Practice one, I want you to look really miserable. Okay? So get your, get your miserable pose on. Sorry, you're waiting on me. Okay, here we go. Right, miserable faces, we're going to go across. Good, right, now I want you to look ecstatic on this one, okay? You ready? Here we go. And they're good, right. Store that up, bring out the miserable one when they need to. Okay. Um, great to be with you this morning. I want to share a little bit, something I only learned a couple of weeks ago. I've been on this planet nearly 35 years, but I never knew this before. I shared it with some of the rocks guys last year, uh, last week. Any rocks who were here last week? When I came down and talked to you guys, I'm going to need some of your help, okay? So we're going to talk about the story of the candy cane today, okay? Now, it'd be a bit unfair for me to be up here with a massive candy cane without any of you. So, boys, could you grab a few of these and give them to any under 18 who wants them, okay? Keep doling them out, okay? Go around the other side, that's it. Just wave at these boys as they come around. There's plenty there for the under 18s. Okay? Now, I want to tell you the story of the candy cane. I only learned this a couple of weeks ago. But apparently, in Germany, about 350 years ago, in 1670, there was a choir master in a German church. Okay? So think Phil Merriman in Germany. 350 years ago, the skinny jeans, got his latte. And he's there, and he's got his Christmas Eve service. He's got his Christmas Eve service coming up, and then we're going to have all the kids in for the Christmas Eve service. And children then were much more noisier than, than they are now. And uh, 350 years ago, the choir master was thinking, how can we keep the kids quiet during the church service? And so he asked his local friend, the candy maker, if he could make some candy canes, some sugar sticks, for the children to keep them quiet during the service. And legend has it that that is how the candy cane came into being. But he didn't just make a sugar stick. He made it so that it contained a bit of a message. So each element of the candy cane has an element of the message which the choir master wanted to get across. And I'm gonna share that message with you today. So, who can tell me who's already whacked into their sweets. How does it taste? Can I hear some adjectives? How does it taste? AJ, shout out for me, mate. It tastes like strawberry, does it? Yeah, give me some more adjectives, some more describing words, anybody? Sweet, yummy, okay? And so what the choir master was wanting to say to everybody who got the candy cane was that this message it's a sweet message, it's a good message, it tastes good. There's a verse in the Bible in the book of Psalms that says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And so everything that we enjoy in life, everything that tastes sweet to us, everything that tastes good to us, whether it's candy canes or whether it's crisps or whether it's burgers or whatever you're into, everything is like a pointer to the goodness of God in our lives. Everything is a pointer to the sweetness of this message. And so the first message of the candy cane is that it's sweet. 
This message is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, who can tell me who's got their sweets? Some of the rocks from last time. How does it feel? How does it feel? What's it feel like? Yeah. Hard. Hard like a... Hard like a rock. Yeah, and if you go down to the seaside, you can get sweets like this, not in this shape, that are hard like a rock. And Jesus said that his, if people build their lives on his word, it's like building their, their lives on the rock. And so you've got two elements to this message. On the one hand, you've got the subjective, this tastes good to me. This, this seems good, this feels sweet. And on the other hand, you've got the objective, whether rain or shine, this message is absolute rock. This message is absolutely trustworthy. You can stand on this, you can rely on this in rain or shine. It's going to keep firm. This message is like rock. See, my voice keeps going to the end. Will it or won't it? You never know. Oh, my candy going to breaking slightly. But what letter is that? J. <laughs> just testing, just testing. J. Right. Everybody knows the answer to this. What do you think J stands for? Jesus. Jesus. Okay, so this message that's sweet and that's firm is about Jesus. It's about Jesus. The one who came to us. The one who was born in Bethlehem, which is a place you can still visit today. Who had to flee for his own safety because of political oppression. Came a refugee, he travelled around when he was 12 years old. Have we got anyone who's 12 in here today? A couple of 12 year olds down there. Anybody know what Jesus did when he was 12 years old? doing now? He ran away? I'm not running anywhere. Okay, so he ran away, he was in the temple, he was chatting to the teachers, and when he was 30, he started gathering followers to himself, called his disciples, he began teaching and preaching about the kingdom of God, he began demonstrating about the kingdom of God, he healed the sick, he cleansed lepers, he raised the dead, he cast out demons, he walked on water, he fed the 5,000. Everywhere he went, he proclaimed and he demonstrated this truth called the kingdom of God. This truth called the kingdom of God. And as always happens, when a new king steps into town, there becomes conflict. And the Roman soldiers, there's a Roman soldier floating around at the back there, I can see it. The Romans killed him. Now, the candy cane also has this part of the message in it. Apart from your mouth, where do we normally put candy canes? Clara, from the back there. Yeah, and how do you put it on the tree? You hang it on the tree. You hang it on the tree. And we use the language of put up on the cross, but the Bible often speaks in the language of being hung upon a tree. To speak about Jesus, Galatians 3.13 says, he took our curse, because cursed is anybody who hangs on a tree. And so the Romans and the powers of the day, they were killing Jesus, because they were treating him like a criminal. And when they saw him up on the cross, they were like, he's a criminal, he's being punished. And the Jews were like, he's cursed because he's hung on a tree. And when he was killed and when he was hung on a tree, we get to the next part of the candy cane message, which is the colour red. Any of the children tell me what do you think the colour red represents in this story? So good, so many of you going for it. Yeah. His blood. So when he was hung up on a tree, he was shedding his blood. So one of the amazing things about Christmas is that one of the reasons, one of the big reasons Jesus came was to die. 
to be hung up on a tree, to take our curse, to take our punishment, to take our being forsaken. They could shed his blood. There's a couple more bits to the message. Apart from red, what's the other colour on this candy cane? Micah. White. Any of the rocks who were here last week tell me what white represents? Okay. Yeah. So it represents cleansing, that Jesus makes us whiter than snow. It's a verse in Isaiah where the Lord says, come, let us reason together. Your sins, the stuff you've done wrong, the way that you've fallen short, the way that things are mucked up in this world, it's like scarlet. But I will make it whiter than snow. Your failures, your frustrations, the way we've mucked it up. It's like deep dark red, but I will make it like wool. So you have this message. It's all about Jesus. It's sweet because it's a message of rescue. It's firm because you can rely upon it. It's about him coming, dying for us, shedding his blood, making us free. There's one other bit about this message, which is the famous bit, which kind of sums it all up. So what was the shape meant to represent, kids? A shepherd's crook. A shepherd's crook. And so in all of these things, Jesus is saying, I want to come and be your shepherd. Now we don't really think about shepherds in the city that much. We're not used to it, but what he's talking about is he wants to care for us. He wants to provide for us. He wants us to know his voice, to be guided by him, and to be rescued by him. And the reading that was so beautifully read, it's one of the main characteristics of the shepherd, is that he lays down his life for the sheep. And so the good news about Jesus, which is kind of hidden away in the candy cane, is that he's done everything necessary to be your shepherd. And it doesn't matter if you're six years old, or if you're 60 years old, or if you're 106. He's here to be your shepherd. It doesn't matter if you're eight, or 18, or 88. He can take the things that you've done wrong, and because of his death on the cross, he can make you absolutely clean. It doesn't matter if you're nine, or 19, or 99. He wants that relationship with you, whereby you hear his voice, you're, you're provided for by him, you're shepherded by him, you're rescued by him. It's the message of Christmas that he came. And Christmas is full of silly symbols. It's full of silly symbols. This is a silly symbol. The gifts that we give to each other. It's a silly symbol. Yeah? We give gifts because we want to, to love each other. Maybe you're into gifts, maybe you're not. You know, I gave my son Hot Wheels cars. It's such a, such a silly representation of how I feel about him. It doesn't matter if you like the symbol or not, but it really matters that you get the reality behind the symbol. The candy cane, it's a silly symbol. We're always stretching, we're always trying to reach, but the thing is, is Jesus your shepherd? Is he your shepherd today? Doors wide open, because he came. So why don't we stand? So I'm going to pray. And I just really wanted to give the opportunity, if anybody wants to say, say yes to Jesus, to say, yeah, I want you to be my shepherd. And that's how you access it. You say yes to him. You say yes to him. 
Like I was saying, it doesn't matter if you're 6, 16, 56, 86. He's there for us. He'll meet us where we are. He wants to be our shepherd. So I'm going to pray. You can pray along in, in your heart. This is where you're at. Welcoming him, welcome him in. Jesus, thank you that you're the good shepherd. Thank you that you came. Thank you for the life that you lived. Thank you for the death that you bore. Thank you for the blood that you shed. Thank you for the cleansing that it brings. Thank you that you're here, that you can be my shepherd. I want to walk with you, be shepherded by you. Follow your voice. Jesus, I want you to be my shepherd. We're going to carry on praying for a bit for people. Tom's going to lead that along. But I just want to say that if you prayed that prayer for the first time, or the first time in a long time, I'm not going to get you to come up the front or anything, but what I really want to encourage you to do is to tell someone. Tell the person that brought you, tell the person that you came with. If you're a parent on the way home, you might want to say to your kids, did you pray that? Well, kids, you can blame me now that they've asked you. Kids, you can ask your parents, did you pray that? I want Jesus to be your shepherd and we can have a chat about that over Christmas. <laughs>